Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Lucas Freyricks, a member of the Davis City Council. Lucas is running for re-election. Lucas, I want to thank you for being on our show. Oh, thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, normally what happens is we ask some questions about how you got here and then go into where you're going. We're going to kind of cut that short here and get into where we're going. But Lucas, you've been working for several years for the legislature right. and you got a new job. Yeah, that's correct. So why don't you start out by talking about your new job and your responsibility? Sure. So um, after 10 years of working in the legislature in Sacramento, just in January, uh, I started a new position here in Davis, actually, uh, for the University of California Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources, so UCANR. Um, I am the statewide government affairs and community relations manager for UCANR. And uh, UCANR is uh, a division of the University of California uh, that is a separate division, not, not, it's not a part of UC Davis, but a separate division of the University of California that actually does a, quite a wide range of things. Um, uh, folks, uh, it has a very large footprint throughout the entire state of California. UCANR is really sort of UC in your community. Um, the most well-known uh, programs that fall under the umbrella of UCANR include Cooperative Extension, uh, which is a program that is in, in every single county in the state of California, all 58 counties. Uh, also, uh, there are, uh, and, the, and the Cooperative Extension you know, is, has roots of over 100 years ago in all the land-grant universities. So the University of California, of course, is the land-grant university here in California. And so um, ANR, uh, Cooperative Extension in each county you know, through ANR, you know, works with small farm advisors, really works with the farmers, works with the folks in the ag community to ensure the county, ag commissioner. county ag commissioner, absolutely, to make sure, and all the counties, to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, the, the research that the University of California is doing is uh, able to be done and applied and be helpful for the folks locally and, and who are farmers and, and throughout the state of California. So the, excuse me, sure, the, yeah. UC recently put out a book on how they're having impacts. Yes. And cooperative extension is far and away the the definition yep. of applied new research yeah. going into the field and then seeing if it really works and if it does disseminating the information statewide. Absolutely. Uh, it's a critical, critical part of the University of California's mission. Uh, and then also, there are a variety of other programs that fall under the UCANR umbrella. Um, the statewide 4-H program, uh, which is you know a youth development program that has similarly over about 100 years old. In California, the University of California administers 4-H, uh, and it's uh, kids as young as four years old up to sort of the 18-year-old range. Uh, there are about 650,000 uh, 4-H'ers wow. in, throughout California. A uh, very large program. So 5%. I'm probably yeah. getting my numbers wrong. 5% no, no, yeah. of About 5% in, yeah, in terms of kids, yeah. Uh, and then also um, a variety of other major programs that fall under UCAN are the Master Gardeners Program, which is a major statewide initiative. It's uh, very important in Davis. It's very important. Very important here in Davis and Yolo County. You know, you, it, locally here we have the, the Central Park Gardens, right, in, in Davis. That is a program that is run by the Master Gardeners uh, here in Yolo County. Uh, but then there are a variety of other programs, the Integrated Pest Management Statewide Program, a lot of the health and nutrition programs, um, as well as uh, even like there's a new program a couple years old called the Master Preservers Program. Uh, and it's similar to the sort of same kind of concept as Master Gardeners. People take credit classes and earn credits to become sort of a master preserver. That is a really, uh, you know, of course, pretty hot topic right now in our society. Lots of people doing preservation of foods and things at home and that kind of thing, so it's pretty cool. The, the, there are interesting economic analysis of what happened during the Great Depression, the yeah. 30s. One of the things that was invented and popularized was the mason jar. Oh, yes. And it was because people were having what later became victory gardens during World sure. War II, Absolutely. but yep. the when I first studied poverty in college as an academic subject in political science, there was a designated level for poverty in urban areas yeah. and a lower poverty level for rural areas. And that's because in the rural area, not only is it less expensive, but you're more likely to barter, you're right. more likely yep. to use, to grow your own food. Absolutely, and do preservation after. And in an urban society at that point, we hadn't figured out yet how to, Absolutely. I mean, where, where we're going in this conversation is 
how does Davis become more sustainable? Right. Okay, that's the bottom line in the 21st century. Absolutely. That's what we need to be talking about. Anything that leads to greater sustainability is worth talking about. Oh, yeah. We have lots of fuzzy things that aren't, but right. uh, certainly 4-H, integrated pest management, oh, yeah. and cooperative extension are great programs Absolutely. statewide. Yeah, and it's actually interesting, you know, just the last note on the preservers program, like master preservers, you know, what's old is new again, right? You know, I mean, it's this sort of, you know, things that were ha sort of were a uh, major part of our society as far back as even the you know, 1920s and 1930s even, and through, the, through the, the Great Depression are now all of a sudden, you know, everyone wants to do preserving of, of food again and, gr of course, growing of gardens. So those are why, you know, both master gardeners and the master preservers are such a, sort of important programs and important face for public face for UCANR, uh, but it's also they've become very popular as well. Um, so in my role <clears throat> as uh, the director for uh, uh, government affairs and community relations, I, I travel statewide. I'm, I'm based here in Davis. You see ANRs here in Davis, but I travel statewide um, and you know go visit all of our sort of outposts across, across the state, different county offices, cooperative extension offices, but also make uh, part of my role is to ensure that we are building relationships as the University of California with our local elected officials. So whether it's members of the boards of supervisors in various counties. Uh, members of city councils, members of school school boards, you know, along the way, water district boards, all those types of folks. Because the reality is, it, essentially, a lot of these local elected folks are essentially like the farm team uh, of uh, ultimately over time, you know, you, you even in Merced County, well, someone who's on the Merced County Board of Supervisors today in five years from now may be in the state legislature or even in Congress in Washington, D.C. And so it's imperative for us to make sure that we've built relationships as the University of California uh, Ag and Natural Resources Division vision uh, to make sure that those folks know the good work that we're doing in their communities today so that when they're in a position later on, they will have those memories and have those inter relationships, interactions, and know what good work that UC is doing. You know, I, you said that to me last time, and what's changed since then is term limits in the state legislature. So there's not as much churn as there's been in the last 20 years. So sure. I, I just want to turn your analysis around. Sure and say the county boards of supervisors and the city councils are the representatives of your constituent population. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, sure. And the degree to which they can communicate your message, yeah. you can simultaneously kick that information back upstairs and say, we're doing apricots great, but we need to do better with peaches and strawberries. So, right. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't think that would be in the same county, yeah. to tell you the truth. Right, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've worked extensively in Sutter and Yuba, and yeah. so I know what a peach county is. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and, Sutter, and Yuba, Sutter County is a peach county. Yeah, absolutely. Strawberries is more on the coast. Yeah, exactly. So I, exactly. I apologize <laughs> to right, no, Royce no. Bringhurst. <laughs> the founder of the strawberry in California, as UCD is known around the world, 40% of the strawberries grown yeah. in the world consumed are Bro Royce Bringhurst UCD yep. strawberry. Developed exactly at UC Davis, yeah. We get $8 million a year for that. Yeah. UCD does, I don't. <laughs> okay, back to reality. Anything sure. more about your job and what you're doing, and what are the challenges that you have in your job? So there are a variety of challenges. It's it's interesting. So right now, thankfully, the economy for the most part in California is doing pretty well, but there are regionally some places where it's not doing so well. So one a good example of this is Kern County. Uh, Kern County receives, you know, down near Bakersfield, good. receives, uh, you know, Southern Central Valley receives a vast majority of its budget from oil oil money, right? There's a lot of drilling, these little small wells that are all over uh, Kern County currently that, you know, they extract a lot of oil and they receive a lot of money from the extraction of oil in, in Kern County uh, and they and that funds a lot of their budget down there. Well, because the price of oil has plummeted to such low levels, uh, this the county, you know, oil money receipts have dropped uh, significantly. So what is happening right now is that the Board of Supervisors in Kern County is having this debate what programs do they keep and what programs do they cut? And so the county board is, boards of supervisors fund <clears throat> uh, cooperative extension activities in pretty much every county across the state. And they have the ability to set those budgets and, and increase them and also cut them. So right now what we're facing in Kern County is we're facing a, a, a situation where uh, we have members of the board, board of supervisors that uh, do not necessarily see the value in the cooperative extension program. Even though Kern County is a massive agricultural county and the University of California cooperative extension program 
provides Kern County with a huge amount of programs and resources uh, for all of their ag sort of needs down there, agricultural needs. Uh, we've been having a real, real struggle uh, making sure that the Board of Supervisors in Kern County is willing to sort of help continue to fund uh, that, that cooperative extension program. So my loaded political question <laughs> is, what does the Congress representative from that district have to say about that, being that he's in the leadership? Yeah, absolutely. Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy, absolutely. The so number he's, two person, the no. person who was this close to being the speaker. Yeah, very close, exactly. Um, he actually, uh, you know, again, UCANR pro provides, and through the Cooperative Extension Program, provides a lot of different services. So everything from the sort of agri strict agricultural side of things, and, and, and farm advisors, and things like crop specialty crop, uh, you know, uh, experts and academic researchers and such on that side. But then they also ANR also provides, of course, uh, and Cooperative Extension provides, you know, other types of programs, more human human uh, services type programs, you know. Um, uh, nutrition for for low-income individuals, nutrition education for low-income individuals, and things like that. For also for children, and with the CalFresh program. So that is, uh, you know, he, they are frankly more interested in in preserving the funding for the ag programs, and maybe not as much the human services side of things. That's not surprising. Yeah, not surprising. Uh, but you know, the the programs are both both sets of programs are. Uh, work very well and are essential, frankly, especially in a place like Kern County, which has a fair share of cha its challenges. And are incredibly cost effective. Very, very cost effective. Food stamps is without a doubt the most cost yeah. effective guy. I mean, I, I love my postal carrier. She and I talk every chance we <laughs> get. Her name's Michelle. I'm helping her write a book. It's about a girl and her name's Victoria. Anyway, the Postal Service is a very efficient thing. Yeah. Food stamps is incredibly efficient. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the most efficient program in the United States exactly. government. So it's, uh, those are the, that's an example of the type of issues that I've been dealing with in just a few short months of being with the U University of California. Uh, I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, we live in such an amazing state, uh, you know, and, and so getting to travel around California and just see both the natural beauty but also just sort of experience all the different communities uh, has been really, really wonderful so far. I'm looking forward to continuing that work in the years to come. So, yeah. That's... I've got a lot of things to talk to you about after we get off <laughs> sure. the show. Okay, so Will Arnold, the candidate for council, Rob Davis, the uh, mayor pro tem, and yep. the next mayor, and you have all announced that uh, you want to see a new general plan. Yes, absolutely. So talk about the general plan and your concerns about it. Yeah, so you know the, the basics are that the city's general plan uh, is just – out, outdated. I mean, simply outdated. And it, and there's, and while some of it is still, I would say, uh, some of, I'll say the bones are okay, right? You know, the bones are still there. There is a real need for sort of some revamping uh, of the rest of the general plan. Uh, you know, the city's general plan is broken down into a variety of elements, okay? The transportation element, the housing element, the sort of safety element, there's a variety of different things. <clears throat> we, uh, I, you know, the city's general plan was start, the last general plan update was started in roughly 1993. It was almost, you know, a you know, seven to 10 year process of updating, you know, 30 different city commissions or, or subgroups uh, with about 300 citizens participating in it. I think yourself, you know, you participated in one, if I'm not mistaken, or if one or more. Um, but it was adopted in about 2000, 2001. The time frame set up uh, on the city's general plan was for a roughly 10 year horizon uh, to about 20, 2010 is when it sort of of what became, uh, you know, essentially outdated at that point. Here we are in 2016. Um, you know, the the population that was uh, sort of envisioned in the you know the 1993, but we'll say the 2000, but the 2000 general plan, uh, the upper end population limit was approximately 60, 65,000, 64,000. Um, we're above that currently. We're you know zeroing in on 70,000 in Davis. Uh, but then the other issue with the current, the general plan that we have in place, I say current, but the current version that is outdated, is that uh, there are a variety of things that the, the general plan really didn't even address. So um, whether people believe in the issue of climate change or not, um, the, you know, whether it's happening or not, I, cer I certainly do, there's no 
uh, real mention in the city's general plan regarding climate change or adaptation policies and how we would actually sort of go about doing that uh, moving forward. There's no conversation in the city's general plan regarding um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the cl sort of climate adaptation or, or you know climate action plan you know as well that type of thing how we how the city responds to some of these things. Fifty three percent of our carbon footprint is due to the automobile. Yes, absolutely. So so basically the general plan transportation element could be designed so it focuses on sustainability yeah. in ways that it doesn't yeah, do now. That's absolutely so right. So that's an example yeah. of how the thinking has changed so much in the last 25 years yeah. that we need to reconceptualize what it is that should be uh, uh, in the, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Absolutely, no, you're right, absolutely. It's, no, I was just gonna say that um, one other I I example is many cities across the state of California are, uh, are instituting uh, public health elements, right, or or youth elements as well in their uh, in the general plan, and so in their respective general plans. So, which is something that is, uh, you know, I think that's a does not exist in our general plan, but is also something that's very important. And you know, we've not really um, put an emphasis on on those items, and so that's something that you know I, I think we should be cognizant of moving forward and, and and look at you know seeing if there's a desire within the fo folks in the community to actually have that type of element included in our general plan. So, so I'm, I'm going to be as unobnoxious here as I can <laughs> sure. about some, what I care about the most. So sure. um, I'm not really interested in general plans. I, when, when, I, when I was in college, I thought I wanted to be a city manager. Mm -hmm. So I, got an in, I was an econ major at UCD. And I got an internship with the chief administrator of the State Department of Mental Health. And there were 14 state hospitals, and they were closing the, county hosp closing the state hospitals and setting up county mental health programs. That was 40 years ago. Yeah. That was when I got involved in state administration. And then I did county mental health work for five years in administration. And then I worked in the legislature. And then I got a bunch of ideas about local government and had to start over. So I took a class in, in systems theory in Sac State in grad school. And at the end of the class, the professor told me about this book, which was then brand new. It was called Platform for Change by Stafford Beer. And 20 years later, so that was in 1976. So in 1993, 20, 17 years later, I met the author's girlfriend. <laughs> And it was so obvious that I loved this book that he called me up and asked me to write the reader's guide that's in the back of the, this edition. So Excellent. I got the last eight pages in my favorite book. So I wrote this in 1993. John is involved in setting up the Davis Community Network a residential citywide computer network linked to the internet. John recently convinced the Davis City Council to run a three-year planning process that Sue Greenwald Chang Hyden took seven years with to revise the city general plan with over 200 citizen volunteers on 14 committees with issues ranging from housing, transportation, land use, and open space, which are state-mandated elements to economics, health and social services, and computers, which are not required elements of the city general plan. There's more in there, but I'm not going to waste your time. That's great. The, the point is that we set up committees that dealt with things that were in the mandated elements, which are housing and transportation and land use. Right. But we also set up some committees in areas that were not mandated. And there were five areas that were eliminated last time that I think we need to talk about. Those are youth, seniors, arts, computer networking, which is a whole, a whole new discussion. Yeah. And then economic development. What, what, this is actually the theme of what I need to talk about. 
When we talk about economic development at the local level, we only talk about land use. We don't talk about real people. Right. We don't talk about land use and development except in terms of money and not in terms of people. Sure, yeah. If we start, and what I'm proposing we do is we look at Davis as, a, as about 12 communities and look at the economy of each of those communities and see how they can be helped. That's where I'm headed. Yeah. So what I'm proposing to the city council is that the next city council actually become a charter commission and we go through the process in about nine months of creating a charter for the city of Davis. The state constitution has a provision called home rule. Right. A quarter of the cities in California are charter cities. Yeah. San Francisco, Sacramento, LA, San Diego, the big ones, of course, Chico, Marysville, yeah. Roseville. Berkeley, like they're West Sacramento. Sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Actually, West Sacramento is not. Oh, they're not. I thought they were. Yeah, yeah. but um, but Marysville um, and Napa. So the, the point is the city council has more authority than they have. So the way I describe it is like this. This is a general law city. Three quarters of the cities in California, whatever the legislature says you do. The other quarter, it's like this. Yep. If the legislature said do it, you're probably going to do it. If they said don't do it, you're probably not. But there are other areas, youth, seniors, right. communication with the computer networking, art, and then economic development. We've got to find new ways of creating jobs. We've got to find new ways of actually serving the local community without being so energy extravagant and we've got data pollution. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we have tremendous inefficiency now in how we do government. Right. So I think that there are a lot of things that could be changed. And so I just want to read you two sections from the, um, the League of Cities. The California League of Cities has a section on charter cities. So this, is, this explains the state law. This is the only part I'm going to read. The California Constitution gives cities the power to become charter cities. The benefit of becoming a charter city is that charter cities have supreme authority over municipal affairs. And the court defines municipal affairs. So if there's any question, the court says the city's wrong, you have to do the state law. In other words, a charter city's law concerning a municipal affair will trump a state law governing the same topic subject to court evaluation. The charter city provision of the state constitution, commonly referred to as the home rule provision, is based on the principle that a city rather than the state is in the best position to know what it needs and how to satisfy those needs. The home rule provision allows charter cities to conduct their own business and control their own affairs, and the courts ruled in 1889 that that was the law. So since 1889, the UC cities that have become charter cities include Merced, Berkeley, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, San Diego, LA, San Diego, Irvine, San Diego. and San Diego. I tried to do it geographically <laughs> from the north. The only city that's a UC city that's a general law city is Davis. Davis yeah. So we have a competitive disadvantage with our sister cities around the state. Okay, that's enough about the charter. Now let's get back to reality. The community energy okay. program. So explain that sure. so I can say it right next sure. time. Community Choice Energy. Community oh. CCE. CCE. Okay, yeah. explain what it is. <clears throat> so Community Choice Energy uh, allows for uh, local government. So in this case, we're working collaboratively with Yolo County on establishing a joint powers authority. Uh, but the city of Davis and Yolo County, we would purchase power. We have the ability to purchase power uh, and, and create, you know, sign contracts for purchasing power, both greener power and less expensive than what is currently offered by PG&E, our, our primary utility. So PG&E, though, as the utility, uh, they would still control the transmission, okay, the transmission 
transmission, transmission lines, and they would still deliver the power. But um, the city of Davis and, the, and Yolo County would uh, basically purchase power on behalf of the citizenry, and we would you would see the city uh, doing that. We, likely, we would work on the ability to uh, have greener power, so more solar, more wind, you know, hydro, those types of um, biomass, those types of uh, energy. But also, the real benefit, uh, and the other thing is that if if a citizen or ratepayer does not want to participate. Uh, in the program, they simply opt out. They so everyone. So is, then they get billed by PG. Right. Yep. Everyone mm -hmm. is currently. Everyone would be. It, first of all, we're about 18 months away from it starting, uh, but uh, that both the city council uh, unanimously approved, as well as the Yolo County Board of Supervisors unanimously approved, uh, forming uh, a community choice energy program here in Yolo County. Um, there are several models that are being uh, pursued and in, in, in up and running in other parts of the state, particularly Marin County, Sonoma That's County. That's the one I knew about five years. Yeah, Marin County was one of the pioneers, certainly. But what they have done <clears throat> over the fa past several years is they have all the cities in Marin County plus Marin County have joined. And then they have actually expanded geographically to be uh, contiguous with Marin County uh, f folks around the bay. So the city of Richmond is now a member. The city of El Cerrito, the city of Benicia uh, is also a member. The unincorporated Napa County is also a member. Wow. So it's grown a bit. But wow, Solano County. So, yep, yep. <laughs> all the way, I mean, that's all. That's not just across the bay. Yeah. That's on the other it's side away. of the bridge. Yeah, absolutely. So they, though, the re and we, we explored that option. Uh, of potentially join, they asked us to consider joining with Marin, MCE is their the acronym. Pacific Ten is now yeah. the Pacific Forty Seven. Right, exactly. You know, we could, UC Davis could play Cal in exactly. football, right? <laughs> no. And that's that's actually why we chose to not join them, though. I think um, we I feel agree. like uh, we would have been the city of Davis and Yolo County would have been members essentially uh, nineteen and twenty of MCE, literally with their board of directors being one member from each of the jurisdictions that is a member. Sure. So sure. Davis and Yolo County would have literally been votes number 19 and 20 uh, on a board of directors that large with, frankly, uh, they're doing a great job, but they're likely to continue to keep expanding. And so, uh, but then also Sonoma Sounds County. Sounds like the European Union. Yeah, exactly. In many ways. Um, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a liability. The <laughs> European Union. No, the so uh, let me go back for a minute just sure. to finish your analysis and say that wouldn't be a liability. It would be a different program. It wouldn't have as much unilateral authority because right. you'd buy into the program as, as they've already established yeah, absolutely. it. absolutely. But it's, it's like if you're the first kid in the family, you train the parents. Yes. When you're the fourth kid in the family, the right. parent's not going to take, you know, what that's you right. have to say twice. Right, that's right. Because they know what happens if they do. It comes a third time. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a problem as YOLO part of Marin County, yep. they're going to go, oh, yeah, we've heard about that problem. Sorry. Yeah, uh, absolutely. No, no, you're right. And so uh, the reason, the ultimate reason that we chose uh, to uh, sort of go our own path is, is the issue of local control. Good. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost. So we have we have good working relationships. We've worked very much so in the past few years on the city council to continue to establish good working relationships with a lot of our local uh, sister agencies, right? Yolo County, our other sister cities in the throughout the county, um, and we have the ability also to generate a lot of that power locally. So the city, we're very fortunate, the city owns the PVUSA site sure. up along Pole Line Road. I'm happy we're in the DMA studio, so I'm sort of pointing in that direction now. Um, but along Pole Line Road, headed towards Woodland, just outside of town. That's north in Just Kitchen north, yeah, <laughs> is, the, uh, is the PVUSA site, which is a solar farm that the city of Davis owns currently. Um, the, the solar energy that is produced there uh, goes into the, you know, the electric grid currently, and PG&E gets it. So there's an accounting system? Oh, yeah, it? absolutely. So we have that. It's a currently about a 20-acre site at PVUSA, uh, but the city owns 83 acres there. Uh, and the ability to expand that solar farm uh, is very easily to very very easily done, uh, and you know as we get into a situation with where we actually launch the community choice energy program with the, along with Yolo County, um, we will uh, I think seek to uh, again create more locally uh, generated energy, uh, which is sort of the direction that the energy industry is moving in already, and then also we so have a whole lot more efficient. It's much more efficient. You know the real cost in the in the electricity world and the energy world right now is that you know you build a power plant here and the people are over here and then 
you have to string wires you know, for 100 miles to bring that electricity across, and that's where uh, the major amount of money is being spent. I know I don't know what an amp is, I don't know what a watt is, and I don't know what a volt is. I spent a year in engineering school at UC Davis. It's why I didn't become an engineer. I do know what an ohm is. Oh, yeah. An ohm is resistance. You put electricity through a wire and some of it gets heated up. Yep. That's energy loss. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, the key is to start uh, it, you know, doing what is known as distributed generation, right? Generate uh, electricity exactly. locally on exactly. rooftops and on solar farms next to cities and things of that nature. So we're going to, that's what we're going to be doing. And uh, it it's, uh, represents a very good collaboration with Yolo County. Uh, we're hopeful that in the next couple of years we can entice um, uh, some of the other local cities uh, nearby, wh whether they're here in Yolo County, you know, West Sacramento or Woodland or Winters, or even some of our other, you know, so just across the Solano County border, you know, D City of Dixon is an example uh, to try and uh, entice them to join. Um, we also believe that <clears throat> there's an ability to have. Uh, Ultimately, less expensive energy costs as well. Uh, you know, not not hugely less expensive than PG&E, but you know, minimally minimally five percent lower, but up to ten percent lower. Um, the other real benefit, aside from besides from the local control aspect, is that uh, every ratepayer in California <clears throat> currently pays uh, what's called the a, a little bit of money each month to PG&E called the public goods charge. Uh, it is a, uh, a pot of money that gets set aside, and it gets read. It's the the point of that pot of money is for the utilities, including in this case PG&E, to reinvest that money into communities in for a variety of programs. But you know, weatherization programs for houses, uh, energy efficiency programs. Well, the city of Davis ratepayers pay approximately four million dollars per year from their utility bills to PG&E. And um, PG&E is often not that forthcoming with uh, how you know that where that money is necessarily being spent. So is that four million that goes into that pot? That's correct. Into a, into a big to, pot, yeah. So very, like maybe five hundred million dollars in money uh, spent. On I'm not sure that it, it, it's Davis? not it's not that large. No, no, no. So the the point was just going to be that we put four million a year into this as ratepayers. And, and it, that money is supposed to come back to our community, I mean, you know, uh, in the form of these types of programs. But is it like 1% <clears throat> which would... Yeah, it's a very, very tiny, yeah, about 1% sort of well, range. They, I it's, mean, it's that a lot. would be $500 million right. total yeah. spent on energy in Davis. Yeah. Which, I mean, my, my bill's expensive and I don't have yes, much at all. Exactly. So, um, we're not sure that that all of that those dollars are coming back every year. You we're know, into, we're into, not into, seeing any right those types of programs being instituted. So the ability there is an ability in the future uh, for us to as ratepayers still we still be, be mandated by the state to have to pay that that public goods charge for you know, public use <clears throat> into this pot of money. But then we would actually have the ability with our community choice energy program to actually set up locally controlled and run and, and operated programs that would benefit the city of Davis and Yolo County, as an example. So uh, I, there are a variety of reasons to sort of pursue uh, the Community Choice Energy Program. And uh, we're very fortunate uh, that we have, you know, in Davis, we, <clears throat> the city council uh, that does not have the expertise in these issues, uh, you know, set up a Community Choice Energy Advisory Committee made up of folks, all from, you know, volunteers from throughout the community, but folks who are you know, ha who have worked for the California Independent System Operator, who've worked for the Public Utilities Commission, who have, you know, vast amounts of experience and knowledge Professional and background. expertise. Absolutely. Uh, Yvonne Hunter, who is the, uh, at the t retired now, but was the chief lobbyist at the League of California Cities that was staffing the Community Choice Energy Bill as it went through the legislature 15 years ago. So, you know, all those folks uh, served on, and a bunch of folks served on uh, this body and helped provide us uh, just excellent, uh, you know, background and knowledge and, 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 and decision-making, you know, uh, sort of the advice that they provided helped us make excellent decisions with regard to this, uh, this choice. So uh, we look forward to the next couple of years as we sort of take the next steps here with, with the county and, and roll out this new program. Um, this is a, an example of another experiment in local government. Yes. And one of the advantages that you have with local government is you can try something and see how it worked. Um, in 2003, we were on the co-op board. Yeah. And 
The co-op at that point was at the beginning of uh, working with policy governance. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm torn between trying to ask you the <laughs> questions I want to answer and just saying it myself, so I'll probably just talk. Um, at that point, we were, we the Davis Food Co-op Board, were about halfway into policy governance. So we were talking about it and, and there are these statements that you agree to and then the point is to govern to those statements. And we had about half of those statements done and we were talking as though we were finished. And I joined the board and came to that conclusion and so if you took what everybody on the board, except for Lucas, knew, it was about the same amount as what Lucas knew. Because you were on the board that actually went yeah, through, few, yeah. like two years before, putting this package together. So I call what Lucas knew to be one Lucas. And by the next meeting, I had become three Lucases. Okay, I had I dove into the books, I dove into the internet, I I read John Carver, I figured out what he was doing, and I studied it and I said, everybody on the board has to get to six Lucases. <laughs> right. And then we'll be able to create the process and go through it. And in the course of the year we did that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there are many reasons why I told you that story, and now I'll tell you the main one. I'm now proposing that the city council go through that process during the next year, oh, yeah. S publicly, yeah. with as much community involvement as we can. And my goal is at least 25% of the citizens be involved in the charter development. So hopefully you consider that to be interesting enough that it's not just complicated. So now back to what happened with the co-op. What we did was we had a meeting and, and you know, like the old city council, we, we weren't very well organized and we needed a new mission statement. In my opinion, our mission statement was about 50 words. It had all these nice things in it about equality and equal pay and all this stuff, but it really wasn't us. So, we sat down, we had a, a board all day retreat, and, and at 10 o'clock, the agenda item was a new mission statement. And, and lunch was scheduled for 12.30. And the nicest woman on the, on the board, who'd been on the board the year before said, if we're not done by 12.30, can we still have lunch? Right. <laughs> because she had no confidence that we were going to be able to make yeah. a decision, the nine of us on the board and the staff. And after about an hour, I said recycling. I mean, that's not me. I mean, we had like 85 things on the list. Oh, yeah. See, this is why I didn't want to ask Lucas to tell <laughs> this. I wanted to tell it myself. And then the lawyer in the group did something I've never seen a lawyer do before. He got to the point. He said, wait a minute, we're going at this in the wrong direction. It's not all the things, it's what's the central thing. Right. Is it food or is it community? community? Yeah. And I got goosebumps right now because then one of the staff people held up an imaginary zucchini like it was a Lincoln log and said, we build, build community, community with, with food. food. And cooperative principles. And in the next 10 minutes, the woman who hoped we'd have lunch came up with community principles, covered all the rest of the yeah. things that, you know, we talked about external affairs, we talked about treating the staff right, we talked about treating the customers right, we talked about working with the farmers, all of that's in cooperative principles. Yep. We added down to seven words. Right. Now, it is possible to create a new concept and then legitimize it and find a way to express it. So my hope with the charter is that we can go through that kind of process. Policy governance is part of that. Policy governance gets away from the bureaucracy. So with that as an opening, what do you think about policy governance? And then I'll close that part. Sure. One. Yeah, well, um, we certainly, 
you know, those were inter very interesting years. I mean, the, the process, you know, of being on this co-op board, the food co-op board, and sort of watching as this, uh, this model of governance was sort of, uh, you know, initially explored by not just this Davis Food Co-op, but also cooperatives, around, all food cooperatives all around the country. It really became a phenomena uh, that the food co-op world really picked up, and you had several, you know, hundred food cooperatives around the country sort of working in tandem in various stages of doing this. And uh, uh, I actually often wonder how, I don't know, you know, if you've kept up with sort of John Carver as the author of and sort of originator of policy governance at all, but, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to find out, you know, what sort of status policy governance is in you being used in today. I'll get into that in a minute. Excellent. Go ahead. But we... Uh, uh, you know, the, the reason for instituting policy governance initially was that you, we had a situation or multiple situations over the years where you had individual directors uh, on the board of directors who essentially were trying, would try to pursue their own specific agenda, right? Uh, you know, I want, a, I want a store in West Davis, right? I'm, that's my specific, not me, but this is saying, you know, someone. I want a store in West Davis, or I want this, or I want that. And instead of fi determining what, the, what was good for the organization or also what the, the body wanted to, to pursue. Um, so policy governance actually really helped to uh, tamp down that you know, individual sort of agenda-driven uh, 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 you know, conversation rhetoric that, that was happening at the time. And so we were able to, you know, by creating ends, you know, end statements, which were sort of the, the lofty goals of what we wanted to see the co-op achieve, and then following all the different types of uh, boundaries, policies, and, and keeping everything Everything else, uh, you know, in check. I think that was a pretty, pretty good uh, process for the food co-op. Um, it's interesting because I, I know another organization in Davis that, at the same time, was also. I didn't realize this until just a few years ago, but I know the, the Unitarian Church. Actually, that was also a phenomenon. In that sort of ten years ago, the Unitarian churches, or Unitarian Universalist churches around uh, the U.S., also became sort of interested in, in policy governance, and so and and started to do the same sort of process. And and uh, you know, I do know of a couple and uh, cities across the country that utilized it. Bryan, Texas, I think, is right, the primary, right. the, sort of the the most well known example. College Town as well, though, in in, in Texas. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it was a very interesting process for us. Uh, as the Davis Food Co-op, um, <clears throat> we we did learn, I think, quite a bit from that. But we're also, you know, it was it was definitely there were some times when, you know, as a, as with any new process you're putting in place and one that's new to everybody, you know, there was a fair amount of just sort of hand wringing and, and just trying to figure out how, you know, it, how. Um, it, it, what we were doing is if it was actually succeeding or not, right? And it was how do you actually measure it? And so it was always really nice to be able to go to the uh, the National Food Co-op Conference every year. It rotates around the country. And to, you, you would recognize that, oh, wait, you know, the, the, the issues that we've been having and facing in our own town, in our own food cooperative, uh, are also the same issues that, that are, that, you know, communities and co-ops are facing all around the country. So we weren't alone, and that was always very reassuring. But um, it, it sometimes, you know, you, you get so bogged down, sort of the blinders on, you get so bogged down in, in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, operations of how things are going that you kind of fail to see, see the forest through the trees and realize, oh, there's actually, uh, you know, we're not alone in this, and there's other people out there experiencing the same types of things. So uh, very good experience overall. Um, but yeah, would definitely love to hear your thoughts too as to what, uh, you know, what you see as both the successes of policy governance or, and then sort of how it's being applied today. So. So I'm going to start by not answering what you just asked me. <laughs> I'm going to start with how it started. Sure. So when I was in Placerville as a 23-year-old kid arguing with the psychiatrist and the psychologist and the social worker, John Carver was doing the same thing. Yeah. Only he was in Michigan or Ohio or yeah. Illinois, one of those states. And he had a federally funded community mental health program, which was one of the innovations of John F. Kennedy. And I don't know, there were 150 or 200 of these focused programs. I, I assume that Hennepin County, Minnesota, was one of the places because there was more innovation in community mental health 
in that county than anywhere else in the United States during, during the time I was involved. Yeah. And it was all about community dynamics. Sure. It was all about creating a mental health support system with the barber and with the taxi driver and the hairdresser sure. and the pastor and the cop. Yeah. Those are the people that are providing mental health services yeah, every yeah. day. The guy at the 7-Eleven store at 3 o'clock in the morning is the primary support system that most people on the street have. So it's um, a, an incredible challenge. Well, this I'm going to contrast two things here. First, I'm going to talk about what John did and compare that to the co-op. But then I'm going to compare that to what I want to do in terms of the city and the city council, because I don't think it's the same thing. Um, what John Carver had was he had a mental health advisory board that was his council. And as with members of the, mental, of the food co-op board, some of them wanted to go in a particular direction. Right. They got on the board to be going in that direction. The fact that they weren't spending unlimited time in that direction is a mistake. And when we need to correct that mistake, when you have nine people like that on your board, you're going in nine different directions, and they're no help at all. Well, by comparison, the people on the job every day, it's the headache they go home with. It's not something that they dream about on Saturday afternoon. Right. And so the challenge is, if you're doing the job 24-7, how do you get somebody that's a community person to help you out? Right. And so the, the concept behind policy governance is, what can the board do that can most effectively help the organization serve its community, whatever it is. And what Carver came to the conclusion was, was the main thing was communication between the group, the people that are being served, and the board. And the degree to which the board can do what's, what we in the co-op call member outreach, uh, meet with the board of directors, right. dinner with the board of directors, yeah. you know, we. We tried a bunch of different things to just do outreach to get people to say, this is the way we'd like to see it better. Because you can find in those kind of conversations room for improvement. Yeah, yeah. And it gets beyond just complaining about what's going on. So with what I used to say in the food co-op was, what can the board be asked to do to take some of the load off of the management of the day-to-day -day operations? And a lot of that's about what should our ends be? Where should we be going? I think they came, the board came up with be the center of the food shed. Oh, right, yes. Which, if you think about watershed, the food shed, um, the UCD is still talking about the World Food Center being in Sacramento, but the Davis Food Co op's actually the World Food Center. So <laughs> we'll, I'll end my speech on that note. The, um, the idea of policy governance in a city, you referred to Bryan, Texas. Bryan, Texas is right next to Texas A&M. On the other side of Texas A&M is College Park. So uh, Bryan, Texas has about 50,000 people. And they decided about 25 years ago to go with policy governance. So their general plan is two pages long. It's a series of positive statements. The water will be acceptable to drink. Now, that includes a scientific definition of acceptable. And once a month or once a year, depending on the report, the Bryan, Texas public engineer makes a report on the water quality and says, we are in compliance with the city plan. Now, that's what I'm proposing we do for our general plan, as opposed to a bunch of negative statements. What we have in this general plan is an attempt to go back to winners. Right. It's an attempt to make Davis as conservative architecturally and transit-wise and economically as possible. And that was the intention of the last general plan. And it's lasted a long time. So it would be great if we could get a new general plan that people could relate to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a challenge, and I think, uh, you know, and I appreciate uh, the, you know, 
both raising this idea with the council, current council, but also the proposal of uh, sort of how we might be able to institute it in, you know, in the, after the election and, and sort of get into the, with the new council. Um, I, I, am, I really appreciate the optimism of, uh, you know, su suggestion and of not a nine month time frame, you know, because I think one of the things that unfortunately we do really well in Davis, uh, you know, is uh, make things go on artificially for, you know, for a long, yeah, prolonged way. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, definitely aiming for a, uh, a, a, you know, a shorter, you know, targeted for focused time frame in which to sort of, uh, you know, either move towards the charter or, just an even updated general plan, any, any or all of the above needs to happen, but it also needs to be targeted and focused and, and done in a timely manner. Um, you know, the, when we updated the city's housing element a few years ago, uh, you know, that, that process uh, was, you know, uh, an appointment by the city council of 15 individuals, uh, you know, as, and a committee essentially, and it took about less than two years, uh, but we were very to focused, targeted, had uh, every other week meetings, and were able to produce really great results, but also in a timely manner, not just having this prolonged, you know, drag on, drag on, drag on type type situation. So hope, I'm hopeful for that uh, as we, you know, in the next uh, and the next sort of after the council election, we get into the fall here to move move in that direction. Well, I'm proposing that the council actually consider it seriously in July and if yeah. the staff is ready in September and move into using Thursday nights for talking about a charter and then systematically go through land use one week, housing the next week, transportation the next week, uh, recreation, taxes and finances, and then end by talking about economic development. Sure. Um, and go through that in September, October, and November, and then in January have the council seriously review a draft document for a new charter and finish in February to put it on the council election, special election in June. Right. And then it could go into effect on the 1st of July, which is the 100th anniversary of <laughs> right. Davis becoming a city. So we became a city in April of 1917. Yep. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. This is what's going on. Thanks for watching. Good evening.